Control sekejap okay, eh. let's, let's just uh, wait for the technical um, assistance. Oh, okay, there you go. Alright. Right? Okay. So our guest, our special guest today, um, Prof. Datuk Dr. Adiba from uh, Faculty of Medicine. So uh, she was the Dean of Faculty of Medicine for many years. Um, I almost say she's the longest serving Dean without knowing. Yeah. So and the the reason we have her today is because she's an, a really, really all rounder in terms of research, in terms of leadership, in terms of um, a person herself, uh, an, an icon herself. So we're very pleased and very proud to have her with us uh, sharing the international in terms of International Women's Day. She is one of the well most well known researcher in UM as well. Uh, during the days of um, HIV and AIDS, uh, she's the one who established the Center of Excellence for Research on AIDS, that's called Sharia right now, that conducts multidisciplinary research on HIV, ranging from clinical to public health and policy research. So we can see from, from the beginning, it's a multidisciplinary approach research that, that uh, currently UM is um, very much encouraging and promoting. She has started that way back then. Um, Prof, uh, Prof Adiba has also um, taught uh, many clinical and uh, academic courses in terms of um, fact, um, medicine and her academic leadership engaged in national and community response to HIV and AIDS. She's currently chairman of the Malaysian AIDS Foundation and an executive council member of the Malaysian AIDS Council, the Peak HIV NGO in Malaysia. Prof Adiba has played a key role in the establishment and ongoing activities and collaboration of regional HIV research network initiative Treat Asia. What we can also highlight today is uh, Prof Adiba's achievement. She's been recognized through several national and international awards including the Tun Mahathir Science Award, the Medeka Awards, and she has also the uh, received and honoured with the Doctors of Law from her alma mater, Monash University. So that's really, really impressive for us to see how Prof Adiba is, share, is going to share with us how the leadership and the research and the academic um, showing to all of us how we can all put this together into what this prof will share with us, where it comes from, all the passion and the hard work that goes into it. So we would really, really like to hear more from you, prof. So without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to prof Adiba. Silakan, prof. Assalamualaikum and thank you very much, Azar. Can you hear me and see the slides? We can hear you and we can see the okay. slides. Wonderful, wonderful. So thank you very much for giving me the honour to speak to all of you today. Happy International Women's Day. Um, I thought I'm, I'm already a has-been, having not been the dean, not being the dean anymore, but never mind. Um, happy to share with you my journey and my experience and hopefully uh, you know, it can shed some light uh, for all you young women and men out there who aspire to climb to leadership roles. Um, you know, Dr. Zeus has been in the news a bit in the last uh, few days because uh, six of his books uh, have been taken off the shelf or something like that for, for um, uh, depicting uh, negative racist kind of uh, stereotypes. But I love Dr. Zeus when my children were growing up. As he said, Azza, I have two boys. They're no longer boys. They're young men now. And uh, I think, you know, uh, as, a, as a starting point, uh, this is a very uh, inspiring rallying call for all of us. Uh, Dr. Zeus says, you have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. And I think 
in terms of uh, inspiring women in particular, because today is Women's Day, um, the first thing we need to do is tell all young girls that they can be anything they want to be. So that's my starting point. <clears throat> and of course, um, you know, we now live in a COVID world and hopefully it will be some kind of post-COVID world in the next 12 months or so. But we all can be proud of the uh, women scientists who have been at the forefront of the fight against COVID-19. The lady on the left is a Chinese scientist. I think she was one of the um, early uh, scientists to describe the, the full uh, genome of the virus that then allowed us to design the, um, uh, the, the, the diagnostic the PCR uh, technology for, for diagnosis that's used uh, you know, uh, on, on millions of people every single day. Of course, uh, the lady on the right uh, with her husband uh, is the one who um, is, is famous for um, uh, you know, discovering the uh, mRNA vaccine. Well, the mRNA technology is not not entirely new, uh, but uh, she and her husband put it all together uh, for COVID and uh, we in Malaysia now are using that Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine. I had my first dose last Monday and uh, the lady in the middle, I don't know who she is, but um, worldwide women, are at the, women healthcare workers, health professionals are at the forefront of um, responding to the COVID pandemic, either as nurses, uh, physiotherapists, social workers, doctors, and it's sobering to know that at an, in a last uh, systematic review of healthcare workers' infections uh, with COVID, 78% uh, has been in women, uh, and particularly nurses, 38%, and that's about in, in uh, a little over 15,000 recorded cases of uh, healthcare workers being infected in women. Fortunately, um, you know, the deaths, uh, well, it's still a lot, it's 1,400 uh, deaths. Um, unfortunately, I should say, men uh, have died more than women, and that's got to do with the, I think, the phenotype and the makeup and, you know, other factors. Um, here to celebrate International Women's Day and to celebrate achievements in women. Um, and this was an interesting debate uh, last year. Um, there was some, some uh, you know, all over the world people were noticing uh, that uh, women-led nations seem to be doing better with COVID-19. Starting off with, of course, Taiwan and then uh, New Zealand and um, several of the Scandin Scandinavian countries and Western Europe. Um, and early studies did suggest that um, the women, women leaders tend to um, have better outcomes when it comes to COVID response. Unfortunately, um, in a uh, much more detailed uh, research uh, published in PLOS One not so long ago, uh, that doesn't kind of uh, um, ring uh, totally true. In fact, um, when they did this very detailed research, um, there was no statistical significance in terms of um, deaths by those countries uh, led by women compared to um, countries that, that led by men. So it was it was nice when when uh, it it uh, it lasted, but there are other many other confounding factors. Um, and uh, as I said, there was mm, there wasn't statistical significance in terms of in terms of uh, death rates anyway, in countries led by men compared to women. <clears throat> so, but still, uh, we have much to celebrate in terms of uh, achieve women achievements, uh, and this day is about that celebration. However, you know, um, Women's Day is also a time for us to reflect and a time for a call to action because there is still um, a lot that we haven't achieved um, and the, the gaps uh, are still remain in terms of gender equality all over the world. This uh, was 
um, I pulled it, this out uh, for International Day of Women and Girls in Science not that long ago. And just look at the stark difference in terms of uh, Nobel Prize laureates uh, in physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, 97% male and 3% uh, women. So there is still very, very much to do and both the International Day, International Day of Women and Girls in Science and today the International Women's Day um, are about a call to action for that uh, gender equality and, and closing that gap. So, over the years and, and definitely in recent times, I think um, there's been a lot of discussion, particularly around uh, leadership and management. Do women make better leaders? Uh, these are, of course, um, you know, interesting things uh, to debate. We, of course, as women would say, yeah, but of course, you know, we make better leaders. But uh, there are studies to show that perhaps uh, the natural nurturing style of um, women leadership uh, may be better suited for uh, current times. We tend to be much more transformational uh, in terms of our leadership style, we prefer to work in a more collegial atmosphere. We promote cooperation. We um, are task focused um, and our communication style tends to be uh, more favorable. And um, so, so these are, you know, some of the um, innate inherent characteristics of us uh, women uh, that may lend itself um, uh, better in terms of leadership in uh, this new millennium. Okay, having said that, um, as, as I mentioned, there are still um, a lot of gaps and a lot of hills to climb uh, in terms of us uh, getting into those leadership roles. Um, last night I was reviewing, I had I have to do a talk um, for yes, and Sam Dabi and um, talking again about women in leadership and what, what are the things that hold us back. Um, in medicine, um, we are in the, the work health force, uh, the health, sorry, the health workforce is uh, largely made up of women, but um, uh, leadership roles uh, are still um, a problem and still largely held by men. Except for um, at UM, I must say, we proudly have uh, my successor is a woman. The um, pengarah of uh, UMMC is, uh, of course, Prof Nazira, a woman. Um, the, C, the medical director of UMSC is a woman and the CEO of UMSC is a woman. Um, Hasniza, the Dean of Pharmacy, is a woman. So Professor Sabri in dentistry, when it comes to health at FOM, is the only outlier. So if Prof Sabri, if you're listening, um, you're very much welcome into the fraternity. But, you know, we, we, we women at uh, UM Health uh, team, uh, you know, um, at least globally, are, um, are quite different because uh, in terms of leadership roles all over the world uh, in medicine it's still very much held by men and uh, you know that that proverbial glass ceiling is definitely still there part of the problem uh, for women in medicine is uh, just at the time when the biological clock is running out for um, having a family that is when usually um, the time to specialize, time to sub-specialize, the trajectory in the usual uh, medical career as well, and, and particularly if you're combining that with academia, uh, becomes very intense. And unless you have uh, very good support, it is very, very difficult to combine uh, those two roles. Uh, I believe um, there's going to be a lot of questions around how I managed to do it and I'll, I'll share with you um, uh, some of my secrets, I guess. Um, uh, a lot of it is, is luck. Okay. Um, in terms of our leadership, one of, one of the other things, apart from all those traits that I mentioned before, by necessity we are multitaskers. 
And I think that also lends as well to leadership roles because multitasking is something that, um, you know, we do on a day to day basis, um, even more so now in this um, uh, COVID environment. Um, we know that uh, not only do we have to continue our roles as professionals and particularly as healthcare professionals, but we have to go home for those of you with young children, um, also become teachers. And if you happen to have um, elderly parents, um, also take on that role as carers. And of course, um, you know, with uh, if some of you have uh, day help in terms of household chores, that all got stopped as well. Um, and so you become the household help, the cook, the teacher, um, and uh, the carer to elderly parents and, and relatives, and on top of that, maintain uh, your own um, profession. So we are adept at multitasking, um, but it can take its toll on all of us, uh, both physically and mentally. So back to International Women's Day. The uh, theme is Advancing Women Leadership in a COVID-19 World. Choose to Challenge. Yeah, so just to share with you my own journey uh, in terms of uh, um, getting on to take on the leadership of um, medicine uh, in this country. Um, I'm not one of those people I, I, I may seem ambitious to those of you who don't know me, but actually I'm not. Uh, and I just, uh, I guess I, I am where I am through uh, hard work. And um, I think the number one item for uh, success and uh, uh, as, as, as a person um, and as a leader is to have passion for whatever you do. And fortunately, I found mine in, in my own career as, uh, international, in, as an in infectious disease physician and then venturing into public health, uh, looking after patients living with HIV when it became very clear to me that, um, you know, just treating them was not enough. We've got to do something about preventing it in the first place. I, um, you know, um, uh, through a grant that I was fortunate to get from the National Institutes of Health um, in the US back in 2003, I was able to put together local data and use that to advocate for a very controversial program, the harm reduction program, um, giving clean needles and syringes to people who inject drugs and uh, giving treatment to people who, in, who use opioid um, with methadone. Um, we had a lot of pushback from uh, the community, from even um, the medical fraternity, but we forged forward because um, I and the people who, who worked with me on this from at the Malaysian AIDS Council and, and our partner organizations uh, believed in it. And we have signs uh, to, to back us up and uh, managed to get the, the government to buy into it and eventually uh, you know started off with a pilot program in 2006 and now it's a nationwide program delivering clean needles and syringes um, across the country as well as uh, methadone programs uh, delivered by the Ministry of Health. The needle exchange program is uh, provided by uh, community groups, um, largely by peers, uh, ex-drug uh, users, and uh, methadone by uh, Ministry of Health sites, uh, and also uh, general practitioners. <clears throat> what that has done is uh, brought the number of uh, people infected with HIV due to uh, sharing of needles from a peak of about, if you, you know, I have it's not shown here, but in um, the early 2000s, when we, we started uh, working on this uh, peak annual infection rate amongst uh, people who inject drugs in Malaysia was about 6,000. And uh, through largely uh, the, the methadone as well as the needle syringe program, you, see, you can see uh, if you stretch that, it's, it's consistently under 
300 new cases per year um, uh, with the continuation of the harm reduction program. So uh, I think without a doubt um, that has been a success. Um, it was uh, a lot of hard work. Uh, there was a lot of criticisms and, uh, uh, you know, because um, uh, people believe that we were giving, we were encouraging people to use drugs, etc. But backed by science, um, and, uh, you know, in a firm belief uh, of, of, of human rights, um, we managed to push it through. And as you can see, the um, changes, uh, the positive changes that have come about this program. So um, if there's one um, lesson that I can share with all of you is uh, be brave uh, to, to and, and, you know, to challenge um, if uh, you know the you 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 believe that you've got the the science behind you and the data behind you. Then people can say what they want to say. Um, and here I quote from Richard Horton: "Science can be a catalyst for the realization of human rights, and human rights can accelerate the translation of scientific knowledge into practice and policy." And that is what I um, still hold. Uh, firmly um, and moving on from um, advocating for clean needles and syringes and now uh, uh, expanding into um, calling for a drug policy reform, moving from a very punitive uh, way of dealing with addiction and people who use drugs to channeling them into health and social support. Um, as some of you may know, we've, we've got some traction on this as well uh, with the government, but it's it's a constant battle. Uh, but it's something that we need to hold firm because uh, this is another favorite quote of mine. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples build the current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of repression and resistance. And that is the source of all greatness in all societies and it's the key to progress in our time. So both those programs that I've chosen to work with or in um, advocating for uh, prevention amongst people who inject drugs through the harm reduction program and now a much uh, bigger reform in terms of drug policy and prison reform. I think it is about um, you know, standing up for others um, and believing and, and having a passion for what you do. <clears throat> the second uh, important, um, important value or important thing to have uh, to succeed uh, in, in moving forward and particularly to succeed as a leader is, I think, to have a vision. And um, just uh, sort of going back in my journey as dean, uh, when I first became dean in 2011, um, I felt that our undergraduate medical program, the MBBS program, needed a change, needed to be transformed. It was 20 years old. It was very much um, a traditional program with um, the basic sciences in the first three years and two and a half years of clinical sciences. And we were getting uh, quite a number of failures in the second, the, in the penultimate year when we sent them all to Klang. And I, I just was not happy with that program. So um, we worked to uh, transform the MBBS grad uh, program into what's now known as the UM medical program. Um, I also knew that, you know, I didn't, we didn't have time. So rather than reinventing the wheel, we looked around and um, to cut a long story short, we went with um, the Sydney program and adapted and adopted uh, the program. Yes, it cost a lot of money. I went to Tan Sri Gauth and said, you know, I need to do this. I want to do this. Um, and he said, OK, you can have the money, but you have six months to do it. Um, it was a bit crazy, but we managed to bring people together. And thanks to, um, you know, really hardworking colleagues uh, led by Prof. Hamima as the deputy dean at the time and Prof. Young uh, currently 
And Prof Jamuna, of course, and the entire team in Merdu, we worked like crazy, <laughs> but managed to, um, uh, again, against uh, quite a bit of resistance from the faculty who said, you know, we've got a great program, we're good, why do we need to change? Um, we've, we've managed to put that in place and now uh, we're all uh, very proud of uh, the UMMP program and the products uh, of the program that um, are serving as young doctors all over the country and continue to be trained. Because I'm a glutton for punishment, um, having stabilized the undergraduate program, we ne next wanted to work on the uh, postgraduate program, the master's uh, program that trains um, specialists all over the country. And this one is a lot more complicated because it's not just a UM program. Uh, we share the master's program with all the IPTAs that provide uh, the, the training programs and it's not just one program, the UMMP is just one program. The master's program consists of uh, I think 15 that we at UM or 17 at UM that we, um, we, uh, we have but um, there's another 11 um, medical schools that also share this, this program. So uh, what we wanted to do was um, bring everyone together and revise the curriculum and work with our colleagues at the Ministry of Health who also have a parallel program into one national training program that's underpinned by a national postgraduate curriculum and the vision of it is of course to ensure all junior doctors we train are trained to the highest standard that can then ensure patient safety and quality of care. Part of the reason we needed to do this was again move from a very traditional apprenticeship, see one, do one, teach one uh, type of training that we currently have with a, a barrier exam at the end to a much more um, modern postgraduate medical education um, style of training now, which is more competency-based training, which, which is also what we, we practice in the undergraduate program. Of course, we had a lot and we still do uh, a lot of resistance, but um, the vision is that we, we that I just shared with you, we needed to train our specialists better um, to provide better care. And um, the objective is to have an international, internationally recognized training that is locally relevant and a curriculum uh, for all the specialties with a common governance structure, a similar structure, common entry and exit strategy, a structured syllabus, a system of progression, a common assessment strategy that's open and transparent. And so we have been working in partnership with all these uh, colleagues from all around the country. Uh, we now have about 12 of these um, specialties that will inshallah be ready to be launched by this year in, in this year's uh, intake. As you can imagine, um, uh, this was not uh, an easy task. It's taken us about five years and people say, how, how hard is it to write a curriculum? I can tell you it is very difficult because most of the, my colleagues who work on this um, in the writing groups, in the individual writing groups, are also practicing doctors, have to write their own papers uh, to succeed, um, you know, have to teach the undergraduate curriculum in their own respective universities, teach and train the postgraduate curriculum in uh, our postgraduate programs in their own uh, universities and so they've been doing this when they can find the time and that's why it's taken uh, this long but I think uh, inshallah when we launch this um, we can all be very proud or at least we in the medical fraternity that that's been involved in this can be very proud there's been many many um, uh, meetings uh, through the years the second uh, aspect of uh, my time as, as Dean uh, in terms of, of the vision that I had um, is, as I said, I'm a glutton for punishment as if the National Curriculum Project was not difficult enough to bring, you know, the, the, the specialists in the country together from all the different universities and Ministry of Health. Um, I now want to align and uh, harmonize uh, the three faculties of health um, as well as uh, UMMC and UMSC and transform 
um, these health institutions into a world-class academic health centre. Um, why do we need to do this? Uh, I believe that we're not fulfilling our, um, our what's the word I'm looking for? We, we, we can do better than what we are now, uh, to put it simply. Um, we're, you know, we're 50, more than 50 years in terms of the faculties uh, and, and UMMC and UMSC is slightly over 20 years. We've each grown in different directions um, with different, um, different focus. Uh, although we're all supposed to be serving UM in, our, in, in, in academia, in training, in doing research and in providing clinical service, but because we've each grown um, you know, separately and, and for UMSC, it also is to generate income. And the focus, uh, I believe, uh, has been lost and we desperate, desperately need to come together with a common vision and mission and identity, I think, um, and need to um, strategically align um, and have clarity of our roles as academic and um, in our research programs and clinical services. And uh, most of all, um, we need to respond to the changing disease patterns, uh, you know, with, with the increase in non-communicable disease, although suddenly we got hit with this uh, pandemic, and of course also the changing demo demographics. Um, and last but not least, um, UM-wide, we need to respond and, and be financially self-sufficient and sustainable. So this was and is uh, the vision behind uh, creating uh, a more unified um, uh, health institution between these this five entities, because if we continue to function the way we are in terms of, you know, dentistry, uh, pharmacy, uh, medicine, doing our own things, um, not only are we less efficient, um, you know, um, we, 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 we're duplicating in some ways um, in several things, um, but, you know, uh, to use the cliche, we, we are stronger together. Um, there are many, many issues between the public and private um, hospital systems, uh, which also need the strategic alignment um, and are coming together. Of course, uh, it's it's not easy. Um, some people think it's it's easy. It's just process re-engineering. I beg to defer. Um, uh, there there are many many issues that need uh, to be uh, looked at. Uh, fortunately, uh, Dr. Tengku, our LPU chair, shared this vision, and um, the board, of, you know, the, the board two years ago also. Um, gave the go ahead to um, to hire uh, PwC consultants to help us with this, um, and we've together working with PwC, we've we've come up with a um, strategic framework, um, and are now at the implementation phase. Uh, we have 99 initiatives uh, that's being suggested by PwC. Um, it remains to be seen whether we're going forward with this or not, um, um, and I shall just leave it there. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, um, uh, all of you just, uh, all of us, I mean, it's, it's, it's normal, isn't it? You just see the successes. Um, failures are also part of uh, one's journey, and, um, you know, um, I think uh, one has to accept failure and um, uh, the important thing is to learn from it. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we can discuss that further in, um, in, in the question and answer time. So I've, I've used those three examples as, uh, you know, uh, some of the important projects that I've undertaken to perhaps uh, more successfully than uh, the other. But uh, in, in order to, uh, to do such um, large uh, transformation projects, uh, what, what does it take to initiate the change process? <clears throat> As I said before, the vision must come first. And what are the characteristics of vision? It, it has to be appropriate for the organization, the time that we live in, the culture and values 
the present situation. Uh, it has to be realistic, informed and attainable. I think, uh, I can't remember whether it was Steve Jobs who said um, that, you know, unless you are able to implement your vision, then it only becomes a dream. Um, so, but still, one has to start with a vision. Um, there's the characteristic things about vision is got to be challenging. It sets standards of excellence and reflect high ideals. And I hope that those three uh, projects that I've been leading or I've led um, uh, have, uh, you know, are examples of setting standards of excellence and reflecting high ideals. A vision needs to set direction. Um, in the case of harm reduction project, of course, uh, the, the purpose was to um, reverse the escalation in the HIV epidemic amongst people who inject drugs. It's got to be persuasive and credible, backed by science, hopefully. It creates focus and hope and promise of a better tomorrow. That was my vision or is my vision for the National Curriculum Project as well as the UM Health Project. Um, you know, and, and hopefully uh, it, it, it gets uh, uh, implemented and uh, reach that better tomorrow that we all want to see. It's got to be inspirational and inspires enthusiasm and encourages commitment. Um, I wouldn't be where I am without, uh, you know, the, the, the support and uh, the commitment of so, so many people and so many stakeholders, whether it was in the harm reduction project or whether it's in the UMMP program or whether it's in the national curriculum program or whether it's, it's in the nascent uh, stages of UM Health. It's got to be well articulated and easily understood and unambiguous uh, guide to strategy and action. Um, it's got to be unique. Um, and um, it has to be ambitious. So I think those uh, uh, those three projects that I described um, hopefully have all those visionary characteristics. But um, so how will you lead the change towards those vision? What are the characteristics of the team that you need and who makes up those team? Um, how do you influence your team? And that has got to, to do with the next uh, part of uh, a few minutes uh, and talking about power and the importance of power uh, that can affect uh, change management. Um, so there are many different types of power and, and uh, when all of you are in um, your own uh, seat of leadership, what kind of power do you have? What kind of power do you want to have? Is it an authoritative, or authoritative one? Or is it one that is charismatic or is it one that, um, uh, you know, is backed by expert knowledge? Um, so these are the different types of power that we, we may have um, that can be used effectively as a leader to make all those transformational vis visionary changes. And as a leader, that's a choice that we make which of these powers you want to unleash on uh, the people that you lead. Is it one that's based on um, principle center power with honor um, and sustained proactive influence plus uh, you know the, the how do you use that power is it with fairness and functional or, or, or is it with functional reactive influence or is it a power that's coercive that uh, instills fear in people and usually this kind of uh, power only generates temporary uh, and reactive control. Um, I know which one um, I ch choose or I've chosen um, and hopefully that um, leads to sustain proactive influence. Because um, that leads to the next important aspect of leadership and, and of success uh, as a leader and that's having trust. Uh, for me, uh, trust is everything um, and it works both ways. Uh, you know, I need to trust the people I work with and I hope that the people I work with have trust in me um, because it's very difficult to manage a team when the trust is low um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we see this all the time. So when you have low trust, then you need to exert more control 
um, and then it becomes a carrot and stick uh, motivation system. I would very much prefer, or rather, and I hope during my time as dean, um, uh, the, the kind of working relationship that I have had with, with the team, with the faculty, and also in, in the other organizations that I work with, whether it's the International Aid Society or Malaysian AIDS Council, Malaysian AIDS Foundation, the basis of, of how I work with my colleagues is uh, we're more colleagues than me, the boss, you, um, the, you know, the subordinate, and uh, we have I, I, I hope that it's through a very high level of trust. And what, what I mean by that is that uh, team members supervise themselves and, and, and the leader becomes a source of help um, and uh, the team knows what is expected um, and uh, you know the, the organization becomes extremely flexible. Of course there needs to be control. Um, but it is about accountability um, and having the right accountability at the right levels um, that, uh, you know, uh, in, in the end, I think, um, generates uh, enthusiasm, generates creativity, generates uh, teamwork and collaboration more so than the carrot and stick uh, style um, and uh, supreme control of uh, the, the supreme leader and in the end what you get is commitment and I think in terms of um, organization organizational um, culture and and uh, the importance of having commitment uh, cannot be underestimated the 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 carrot and stick as the earlier slide I showed you will work to a point but you want um, teamwork, you want, um, you know, commitment, you want people to to work um, outside of their boxes and, and give their all. Um, and I was very fortunate to have that uh, during my time as dean. Um, and I think largely that's got to do with the mutual trust um, that I had, not just uh, with the immediate uh, team, the deputy deans and the heads of department, but I'd like to think um, with the rest of the faculty as well. And finally, as leaders, uh, of course, uh, today is International Women's Day and, and, and <clears throat> it's about inspiring young women and young girls. And the most important, th one of the most important things is um, for us women, uh, sorry gentlemen out there, there's uh, gentlemen out there listening, uh, is, is to be, is to support each other and to be a mentor for um, other women and men uh, coming up uh, the ranks. Um, so for those of you young uh, ones listening out there, don't be afraid to seek out mentorship. Um, learn to recognize the accelerators in your life who um, in your life, in your immediate sphere, uh, can help you um, climb that ladder. And it doesn't have to be your head of department. It doesn't have to be the obvious ones like your PhD supervisors or, or whatever. There may be other people who have nothing to do with academia but can provide you with that support and um, become that accelerator in your life. And finally, remember, uh, just uh, as with trust, mentorship is also a two-way street. Yeah. Okay, so just to wrap up uh, my thoughts on leadership, um, it's about passion. Number one, you have to have passion and, and do, do what you do for the right reasons. It shouldn't be about, you know, getting that Q1 paper, it shouldn't be about that KPI. Believe me, um, if you do the things for the right reasons, all those things will fall into place. Yeah, Don't chase Q1 papers and don't chase your KPIs. Easier, to, easier said than done, but um, you know, uh, if, if, if uh, you excel, um, and to excel you have to have passion, um, like I said, um, it will all fall into place. Sec secondly, uh, you know, you can't have leadership without vision. Uh, and I've shared a lot about that uh, already. And uh, using your power as a leader uh, uh, 
correctly um, and uh, so that you engender commitment and uh, support and teamwork um, from the people you work with. And finally, uh, trust and, and just like mentorship and, and I say it again, trust uh, is a two way thing. And finally, I think um, all of this uh, uh, would not have been possible without the teamwork. And these are just pictures of the various people I've worked with um, in different. Uh, so, so this is my immediate infectious disease team. Uh, this is people from the Malaysian AIDS Council. This is the research team at Cheria. This is the drug policy team. This is. Um, this is the national curriculum team. Uh, so it is about lots and lots of people coming together with a common vision um, to make this world a better place, whether it's in providing the best clinical care or doing great research or making lives better for people who use drugs through and, and people in prison through drug policy reform or giving care and support and prevention for um, for people living with HIV or people at risk with HIV, and serving the nation in in terms of um, uh, in terms of improving the the current training program for specialists who all who one day will be looking after all of us. And finally, of course, um, the team at uh, PPUM, the all girls team, uh, former uh, Timbalan Pengarah Hospital, Prof Azura Sashila who leads. Infection control, current Pengara from Nazi, Sharifa, the head of infectious disease, and the all important nurses, and, and Puan Chit Zhu, who's the current um, deputy director of the hospital, and the all important nurses who often get forgotten uh, in terms of how important they are in, in providing the clinical services. And lastly, heads of departments and, and deputies um, in the faculty. These are all uh, people who've made um, my journey as, as the Dean and, and all the different hats that I wear, uh, so much more uh, fun, so much more uh, possible, so much more productive, um, uh, thanks to all of them. <clears throat> and it's because uh, these are the people of the future that we want to um, train to the best of our abilities. So. I want to end <clears throat> with two people that I admire, um, uh, Amanda Gorman. I don't know if any of you watched the uh, Biden inauguration. She's a 22-year-old poet laureate who um, you know, gave that amazing uh, poetry at the Biden uh, inauguration in January. And this is a, another piece of poem from her, which I think is just so um, apt for us. Uh, at UM. <clears throat> this was, of course, she was talking about black history, but I think, um, you know, the words uh, certainly resonate for us, or at least for me, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of at UM, of, of who we are at UM. So, we climb in a community, celebrating our history and creating, <clears throat> excuse me, the future in our own reflection. Each of us is a threat, a connection, heading to together in a single direction. We step forward, we go all in. We know becoming the best, I get very emotional, means raising up all the rest. <clears throat> because victory doesn't begin until we all win. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, another woman um, who recently passed away, another famous uh, poet from the US, uh, another famous black poet from the US. You can only become truly accomplish at something you love, uh, so that talks to the passion that we all need. Don't make money your goal. Instead, pursue the things you love doing and then do them so well that people can't take their eyes off you. So, Maya Angelou. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof Adiva. I think a lot of us felt a little bit emotional in the end. <laughs> Thanks for the poetry as well. Yes, uh, uh, I, I don't know where to start my questions. It's overflowing. <laughs> but um, we can really see your passion and your sincerity and honesty in putting your heart into what you're doing. 
that's why we are getting what we are getting right now the HIV, the MBBS program, and a lot of other things. And you mentioned something about mentorship. I guess um, I, I I believe that you are already a mentor to many of us, a silent mentor, I must say. Yeah. So so um, our hearts go to you, and uh, we're really proud to have you here. Um, perhaps I could start with the most question I get, which is the family work-life balance. Perhaps you want to start with that before I get to the other questions. Please, Prof. Adipa. Sure, Azza. And um, let me start by saying that, um, um, you know, I am extremely, extremely lucky. Um, not everyone is as lucky as I am. <clears throat> I come from a very privileged background um, and uh, married well. <laughs> so when my children were growing up, uh, I had help. Uh, let's say, you know, that, that, that cartoon of the lady with, you know, all over the place. I have been very fortunate in having home help that's been wonderful from the time my children uh, were born. So I don't do any domestic chores. So if there's a secret, that's it. I don't do any domestic chores. Um, and also, you know, I, ha I have a driver, so, but I, I, I understand that not everybody can have what I have. And, and so, you know, when, 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 when colleagues need to go home early to pick up children and all that, I completely understand. Um, so that's, that's my secret. I'm, I'm married well, um, and, you know, um, so for those of you who are not married, be sure to marry well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, easier said than done, and and I think more importantly than marrying well is choose your mother-in-law. Uh, choose your mother-in-law. That's right. I was, I, was uh, I thought you were saying choose your husband. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, choose your mother-in-law because both my mother and my late mother-in-law were instrumental in helping us bring up the two boys. My husband and I, we were very particular about um, uh, although we had very great home help. Uh, and we trusted them through the years that my children were growing up. Uh, as many of you know, I, I travel a lot. I travel overseas a lot, and so did my, my husband. But we made sure that at any time, either one of us is at home. Uh, it was very rare when my children were growing up that, um, you know, one, both of us would be away. And if ever that happened, even, even if one, well, if ever that happened, even with, with our, you know, um, home help that we trusted, we would have my mother or my mother-in-law who was living in, in Australia at the time be with the children. So, you know, I, I was once asked, you know, what what do I consider to be my <clears throat> my biggest accomplishment? And I think without a doubt, and this year I get emotional again. <laughs> it's in it's my two boys. who are now, you know, great young men. So put time into making sure uh, that family comes first. Yeah. I totally agree with that. And for us um, young academics who are listening around here, I think that's that's a, a, a really important realization to make that you have to put time for your family first because everything else will fall into place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to open the floor now for any questions from the audience. Um, we do have the first one from Dr. Amira. Would you like to start, Dr. Amira? I can see it here. Yeah. Can I read it out? Yeah. How do we influence people who prefer carrot and stick and supreme leader st uh, style, supreme leadership style, to see that trust and mutual respect is more effective? Yeah, I know this is tough and we're all going, uh, we, we, we see this from time to time. Um, I, I, I think, you know, one of the cultures, uh, one of the negative um, Asian culture, I should say, is we tend to suffer in silence, right? Uh, we may not um, agree with this, with this kind of uh, carrot and stick leadership, um, uh, but we, we we don't say anything about it. We just, we just continue. We complain. We bitch. We, you know, 
uh, we have passive aggressive resistance, but we don't tell our supreme leaders this is not what we want, this is not how it should be done. So I think, um, you know, uh, be part of that be part of that uh, generation that dares to speak out, you know, um, otherwise um, it will continue. Where do you draw the line um, from uh, being submissive in a way into being dare to speak up? What, what would be the decision or, you know, what's, what should be the thinking behind? Should you wait for a certain thing to happen like your promotion or what do you wait for sometimes you know I think, I think it goes but back to uh, what, I, what I say if, if you know what you're doing is the right thing you know you know based on based on best practices based on data based on you know uh, lived experience and and you know that that is the right thing to do then don't wait, you know, just because you're an associate professor doesn't mean that you can't speak up, you know, um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, or just because you're a new lecturer, just because you're three years now, just, just three years in service, you know, yeah. you, you, you should be brave enough to voice it out, yeah? Yeah, but of course, uh, it, it, you know, you, you, you should do it, um, in the right manner and with, with proper channels and uh, you know and, and try and try again mm -hmm. consistency paves the way yeah uh, we have a second one dr chu how yeah. do you keep your spirits high at times when everything seems to be against you <laughs> yeah okay um i used to joke and and i think my colleagues uh, at the faculty, particularly the deputy deans, all know and all, all hear me say that I think, again, you know, I talk about being lucky. I think I have um, an extra O gene for optimistic. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a naturally optimistic person. Um, and, uh, you know, I believe that every little change that we make, like what, uh, you know, that, that quote from Robert F. Kennedy says, um, it, it accumulates and, um, you know, it, 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 one day it will, uh, okay. you know, the, the moss will become something bigger. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing is also the importance of self-care, you know, um, take time out for yourself. Um, I, I, I exercise and now I've taken up gardening um, and you know you can't you're not going to be any good to anyone if you're not good to yourself. Um, and thirdly you know I may not be very religious but I'm very spiritual I think and um, believe that there is you know that Allah is there to guide us and he knows best. Or if if something doesn't work out, maybe for a good reason, and uh, you know, he's there to guide us. So I think um, those are my basic principles. Yeah. I like the fact you mentioned about the optimism, optimistic gene. Yeah. <laughs> Very few selected people get that gene, <laughs> and we do here. Have being in ADEC myself, we do here. Um, young lecturers or even middle stage um, academics, they are afraid to move forward because simply of being afraid. Kalau ni takut yang ni, kalau yang ni takut yang ni, you know. So, um, in the end, they do things the safe way. So, I guess um, that particular gene, I think we have, if we, we, we think we don't have it, maybe that's something worth building up on yeah, it. yeah, you know, and I think if you have a very strong sense of conviction of, and that you are you are doing the right thing, you know, even if, you know, I I, I went through some horrible times during the harm reduction um, period. I, I was even accused of fudging the numbers and things like that. And for a scientist, that was like, you know. <laughs> But uh, I, you know, I, I had a very strong, strong sense of conviction that what I was doing is right. Mm. 
mm-hmm. um, and you know you you just forge forward mm-hmm. you know, and, and the, I guess I've been proven right yeah yes and it really helped that you have your science yes did you have to wait until the data was published or no definitely was it parallel? Not. Definitely not. And uh, one of the criticisms at the time was that, ah, but Prof Adiba, this is a Western concept, you know, uh, you know, and and um, it's not going to work. It's against Islam and all that. So I, at this point, I should I should point out that, you know, having allies uh, is super super important. And I want to call out to one of our ex colleagues, uh, Sheikh uh, Shafuddin, who was formerly from the Ekan. Ek- Academy of Pengajian Islam. At the time when we were advocating for uh, the Needle Syringe program, uh, Sheikh was at um, IKIM and, and we wrote actually something together on um, on how the principles of Makassit Sharia was not uh, against uh, harm reduction uh, because it is about preserving lives. Um, and so that, that was uh, a, a very helpful and powerful piece that we used. Yes. Yeah. And now people are talking more and more about Makassit Sharia. Mm-hmm. And you know, you could apply to any broader sense. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, broader, broader sense. Thank you for that. Um, another one from Dr. Noran, Prof. Noran Nakia. How do you build your inner resilience? Aha. So, first, I think it's, it's about that self care. Um, and. Uh, uh, that that strong sense of conviction and and Noran, I think it's 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 also um, that strong connection to Allah, you know, that He's there to guide and protect. Mm-hmm. See, I get emotional again. <laughs> <laughs> we understand because it's a life you have to grow go through it through uh, through your life, and it's the grit, the grit, the grittiness, you know. Um, Apart from that optimistic gene, it's also the the grittiness gene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, Dr. Nora, would you like to add anything? Hi, hi, Prof. Adiba. Hi, Naran. Thank. You. And, and yeah, like you, I, I'm also in tears right now. <laughs> and uh, working with you, especially, um, I think one of the things that. Uh, I, I really salute you was during our COVID time last year in March where a lot of things were unknown and you let the team like, I mean, we felt so safe with you heading the uh, COVID task force and, and really, Prabhadiba, that's thank you. I mean, you, you really helped us a lot. Thank thank, thanks so much. <laughs> it's okay. We can be in tears because it's Women's Day. <laughs> 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 Even I'm in tears now. <laughs> Let's take one from Dr. Adelian. Thank you, Dr. Noran. Uh, Dr. Adelina, if you if you are around, you want to switch on your camera. Tell us about the horizontal collegial relationship with your staff, and uh, has this ever limited you in your handling of conflicts of subordinates? Yeah. So, you know, I think um, this comes from my upbringing in a way. Um, I shared with you that um, I come from a very privileged background, but the way I was brought up by my my grandma, my mother, my my aunties is that you know everyone is is equal. Um, we had we had you know I grew up in Kota Baru and we had a house full of of servants, you know, but they were more like family, and I think that that kind of um, uh, instill that that equality, you know, you know how I fight for social justice, and of course, um, going to Australia, I think that yes. um, that cemented it even more. You know, I, I often tell the story. Why am I crying so much? Maybe it's because I'm tired. <laughs> Maybe I'm tired. Uh, let me go get some tissues. <laughs> okay. How many of us are also? Um, in tears. <laughs> I'm actually feeling quite so much really as well. Can lift up our hands. <laughs> oh, so well, anyway, in, in, in Australia, of course, uh, I think opened my eyes a lot to the um, the the egalitarian society that is uh, is is you know part of uh, the Australian culture, um, and how you know you you get on a bus. 
and people say hello to the bus driver and, and things like that, right? So I think slowly but surely that got built into my, my DNA. And of course, uh, working with people who use drugs, going to prison, going to, you know, un under the bridge and all that uh, to, to speak to people who use drugs, going to child kit, just um, made me realize that we're all human beings, right? Yeah, true. So, uh, you know, one of the things I cherish most, of course, I cherish Oh God, I'm useless. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I cherish most at the faculty, and, and as I say, of course, uh, you know, colleagues like Noran and, and everyone else, but let me share a little secret with all of you, something that I'm so, so proud of, you know, the, the boys in the dean's office, the, the, um, the, what, what, I don't, you know, the rashids of the world, Azizol's, uh, the past, you know, every year for my birthday, they will always bring me a cake and balloons and sing happy birthday to me. And I think, you know, of all the things that I cherish most at the faculty is being, being, um, I don't know, being, being, being appreciated mm -hmm. by people that who you expect to be least appreciated. So. I think you know, and 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 how how do I how do I do that? Uh, I think by just being nice back to people and and being um, um, seeing them for who they are and and you know appreciating them for who they are. But of course, um, if they don't perform <laughs> or if there's problems, then you call them up. You know, just just like everything else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about this, I don't know why I'm so tearful. Maybe because I think it's, it's good, it's good, right. Prof. It's from the heart. I, I understand. I, I also had my training in Australia. Dr. Amira had her training in you live in Melbourne, Dr. Amira, for a while. And we can we 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 really appreciate and understand that that uh, oneness, that collegiality, that culture that um like you said cemented it for you. Um Dr. Amira, would you like to add something? No, I'm just, <laughs> yes, I did live in Melbourne. And yes, um, as, as you mentioned, uh, Azhar and Prof. Adiba, it's we do learn something from there. They learn something from us too, I think. But yeah. the idea of collegiality, of everybody being um, respectful of everybody else, yeah. no matter what your station is, that's something I really appreciate it from my time in Melbourne. <laughs> Mm. That's true. I guess that's what uh, pulls us forward. It's like a, a natural force that that you don't have to think of the negativity and the uh, you know, if I might put it, if I might use the word politics, if you know, the the uh, unnecessary things. You mm. could you just you because you have trust and you um, believe in people as they are, then you could focus your your strength and your effort into productive things, into looking forward, rather than, you know, having to deal with all the side things. I think Correct. that really helped. Yeah? Mm. Right. And, and one other little secret that I have, when, when I became Dean, uh, my colleague, um, Steve, well, with Steve Weasling, who was at the time the Dean of Monash, um, said to me, Adiba, if there is one thing I can uh, share with you about becoming Dean of a very big faculty is, um, you know, unless it's a matter of life or death, don't sweat it out, you know, don't lose sleep over it. So don't sweat the small stuff. Um, easier said than done, of course, uh, because uh, Steve said to me, you know, when when something seems like it's the end of the world, you know, that the, the, a, a crisis or a problem seems like it's the end of the world, he said, believe me, you know, you you work through it, and then two weeks later, you look back and you think, what was that all about? Why did I lose sleep over it? You know, so I, in in many ways, I um, hold firm to that. Uh, you know, whatever, however big the crisis may be, it will pass. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, unless it's a matter of life and death. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. True. I guess the, the, the sense, if I may put it as a question, the sense of security that people have. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had the advantage of having a, you know, a safe and, you know, a nurturing upbringing that you could um, focus things on the, the, the productive ones. Um, a lot of us have that insecurity feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a lesson of motherhood as well. Yeah. When you, you know, you, you want to provide for your children, you, you focus on the basic needs first. So as yeah. academics as well, when we look at things uh, as an academic, what are our basic needs? If we don't have that basic needs, perhaps that's what we should, you know, address yeah. first before you could, you know, look forward. Hmm. Um, any other questions? Uh, One question on how do I maintain my health? <laughs> Both ah, okay, please. So physically in the last few years, but, you know, as soon as I turned 50, I started having aches and pains everywhere, you know, and at one point I thought, you know, I was going to need a hip replacement. And then I started to um, exercise regularly. In fact, um, this morning, I, you know, okay, again, you know, full disclosure, I have a personal trainer who comes in at 6.30 in the morning. Again, not all of you uh, can afford that and I'm, I'm you know, very sorry to share these sometimes unattainable uh, things that I uh, have have been lucky enough to have. But you know, you don't have to have a personal trainer. You 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 know, there's all these videos and things. But I just need it for motivation. If she doesn't come, I don't do it. <laughs> so she comes in at six thirty, about three four times a day, and I mean a week. And we do you know a mixture of yoga and pilates and running up and down the stairs. Um, I have a group of very, very good friends, both within the within UM and outside of UM. Um, outside of, within UM, yesterday, we uh, the group of us went to Sungai Bulo and spent half the day there. And what suddenly all of us uh, are into gardening just by chance. We 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 all discovered that we all love gardening. So we went to Sungai Bulo yesterday and had a fantastic time until my car wouldn't start. To come back um, and also a, a group of friends uh, my husband and I have got a group of friends um, through through my work through his work you know through mostly the Malaysian AIDS Foundation that have become really really good friends and we see each other we have dinners out and things like that so I think that that is super essential for mental health and of course I have a huge family uh, a close-knit family that also important um, to be in touch with and, and you know to talk about things outside of work. Having said that, a few of them are doctors, so it's not always easy to not talk about work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Prof. A question on leadership. Uh, if I may read it out, it's from uh, the registration form, did it? Uh, please elaborate on what you think are the particular challenges or suggestions on managing academics, especially those who are demotivated or underperforming. Yeah, I think it's always important to know what's behind all that. You know, there are some who are really, really beyond redemption, beyond help. But I think if you sit down and talk to some, then often there are things like juggling, you know, looking after a sick mother or, um, you know, uh, having marital problems or a sick child, you know. Um, I I recall when, when I was dean, we were sick. At that time, pharmacy was still under us. Um, and, uh, you know, this, there was a student who, um, you know, her grades were just going down. And when we called her in, it turned out that her father had remarried and, um, you know, um, was asking the mother, you know, her, her 
the, this girl's uh, mother for money and was also harassing her on campus, asking for her uh, a scholarship money and, and things like that. So, you know, um, that, that, that made me, you know, that, that opened my eyes at the time. I was quite a, a new dean to, to not just assume that if someone's not doing well, that they're either um, stupid or, um, you know, they, they're lazy or whatever, that often there are things, um, there are risk factors and there are reasons behind it. So I think it's always important to get to the bottom of things first before just uh, reacting to it. Mm -hmm. And when you say to get to the bottom of things, it's um, in a way you don't delegate terus, you know, you yourself have that interest to find out, yeah? Um, uh, there's, let me just try to read this out. Another one on your leadership. How did Prof Adiba spread? her message or your message about the research work in HIV to the masses in a global scale? Um, you know, like what my Maya Angelou said, when you do when you do things and you do things well, you get noticed. Um, so uh, what we did in terms of reversing the, uh, in terms of implementing the needle exchange program was was really really attracted world attention because Malaysia has always been known to be um, you know uh, very uh, conservative and in terms of uh, our drug policies very punitive etc so that 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 was quite a, a groundbreaking um, decision and then of course um, you know, I have to give credit to my long-term collaborator, Professor Rigaltis. Um, you know, we've we've generated millions in terms of uh, research grants, and he writes prolific prolifically. Um, and uh, you know, uh, so a lot of our research uh, gets published, um, and through that, you know, I have uh, built a network um, of people of of working with people at the very, very, very highest level of um, the HIV world. I mean, some of you know that I got to um, interview Tony Fauci recently. And yes, that's, yes. That's because uh, it was a conference that we, we, as in the International AIDS Society host, and me being the president, you know, we get to do all these fun things. I mean, I've known Tony Fauci for a while. Um, so, so not not very well, but you know we've been on different panels together. So I think, um, yeah, uh, this 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 speaks to the importance of um, putting every effort that you have um, with your collaborators, and uh, the Americans in particular are very demanding, uh, but. Uh, you know, you work uh, at the highest standards and, um, uh, you know, uh, they pull you, they pull you with them. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's also very important that uh, we stake our, um, you know, share in, in, that, uh, in that collaboration. It's not just about, it's not, again, it's not a one-way collaboration. We give to them as much as they give to us. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. So, is that that's the value of collaboration, the value of collegiality. Um, Dr. Amiruddin, would you like to ask anything? Dr. Amiruddin, I can see you unmuting your microphone. Sorry, Dr. Azar, sorry. No, eh? Tak ada. I ingat ke ada soalan. Okay. Uh, okay, that's one here from Dr. Amy. Thank you very much, Prof, for your insights and sharing your own growth journey. It is a real struggle in the current environment not to benchmark our growth in UM according to the set KPI. Do you have any practical insights on how we can go beyond the KPI mindset in the academic journey? Well, I think first of all, you all should respond to that survey that uh, Pakaum sent out in terms of what you think of the KPI. So if you truly don't like it, say it, you know. Um, and in medicine, in the last round of KPIs, we we really fought hard to have what 
is now the multi-track system that may not work so well for the other faculties, but we needed it. We need, we still need it because, you know, um, in th those days, uh, you know, nine, ten years ago, we were measured, we, when I say we, in, uh, those of us in Faculty of Medicine, uh, purely on, on research, and yet 90% of our time was about giving service and, and tr you know, training undergrad, you know, the academic side of things. So, hence, uh, we, we fought hard to get the multi-track system, which I believe um, has served as well. It may need some tweaking, um, uh, but it, it, should, it should definitely be continued. Now, um, in terms of the KPI mindset, I think it's important to have targets. It's important to have um, goals, but it shouldn't be kind of the be all and end all. And especially if it's unachievable, if it's unattainable, you know, it's it's got to be realistic. Um, you know, that's you know, I talked about having a vision, and have you know, a, a vision is only a dream if it's written on paper and it cannot be implemented um, and uh, you know um, money is scarce at the moment so whatever KPI we set has got to be balanced against you know the resources um, to achieve those KPIs. I don't know about other faculties but doing research in medicine is incredibly awesome. expensive. <laughs> You mentioned um, about being uh, about the financial constraint. Um, my follow-up question that I would like to put forward is: How do you make decisions when you have not necessarily just money resources in terms of money, but um, but primarily people are when when people talk about research, they talk about funding, grant money, but. Um, in times like this, especially when you are new, academic staff, you don't have um, that easy access to, you know, um, some people are more privileged than others. Mm -hmm. How do you make that decision on um, what, to, yeah, what to prioritize and what can you do practically and what, what's your thought on that? Yeah, so I think, you know, we can be creative. Uh, yes, I say doing doing research in medicine is often incredibly expensive, um, but there are many, many things that can be done that may not cost money. You know, all of you, all of you are welcome, I'm saying this as if I'm the director of the hospital, uh, to PPUM. It's your living lab, you know, it's your living lab and so a lot of things can be done without, uh, you know, uh, a lot of money. I, I, last week I sat down with uh, Dr. Norhaya D from Alambena and uh, Prof. Yao from Engineering because my current obsession is with uh, ventilation and COVID-19. And so, you know, we, we, we're going to go, uh, Norhaya T and uh, Dr. Norhaya T from Alambena and, and Prof. Yao and Prof. Ng hopefully together with the team from from uh, SPM, from Medicine, uh, uh, um, Victor and Marzuki and um, uh, Ma uh, Victor, Marzuki and Nazreen and all that can go and measure the ventilation uh, and whether it meets the WHO guidelines or not at the hospital. And that's not going to cost a lot of money. And if you get the method methodology well, um, you know, if you get the methodology right, that's a uh, totally publishable kind of research. So you need to be creative. You need to, in in that case, it's it's a it's research that could be very very impactful, right? Um, so uh, in a way, I I think this obsession with KPI and getting it in Q1 journals limits our creativity because people just becomes very tunnel vision and just kind of. Uh, you know, are desperate to to do research just for the sake of research. Um, yeah, open your minds and and use use faculty of medicine as your living lab. Thank and you. Also, That's awesome. Many many of us also have community projects that yes. then extends our reach, uh, including myself. You know, like one of my colleagues, Dr. Ika from SPM, uh, is is working with colleagues from education. 
is working in from colleagues from Academy Pengajat Islam looking at this whole issue of drug use uh, and, and HIV. We That one needed some money, that one uh, came from uh, LRGS if I'm not mistaken, but you know, um, especially for younger researchers, come, come to us uh, and, and, you know, work, work with us. Thank you so much for that offer. <clears throat> the, the, the idea of um, PPUM as a living lab is really, really interesting and really tempting. We just need to find the way and for that, for finding that way and that connection, it takes effort and try and error it's there's no recipe book that th this is from my own understanding there's no you know recipe book or guideline that okay step one do this step to do this yes yeah yes. it's it's a trial and error and, and keep keep trying keep trying on on getting the right connection and um, it's also um, about being hands-on with your research I guess having a long duration of heavy heavily funded grant money we become too reliant on our ras that we don't we lost touch of how to do research ourselves without the ras i think that's also something that we we could um, brush up the skills that we could brush up again when you know you don't have the privilege of having the uh, 1200 1500 a month anymore for an ra perhaps uh, the projects that you mentioned the examples of projects that you mentioned just now highly publishable but only requires some logistics and yeah, some yeah. some some effort on your side as a researcher we are trained to do research ourselves yeah why is it when we become an academic that bit we delegate to our ras so when we don't have the money we felt um you know that yeah. that kind of uh, idea right. so perhaps that that's a good um advice from you as well um I'm looking if there's any um, other new questions from the floor. Any of you who would, okay, um, if you have any question, uh, okay, I'm getting two now. Um, feel free to just switch on your camera if you want to ask it, uh, ask the questions yourself to Prof Adipa directly. It's not, bukan senang eh, dapat, dapat online face-to-face -face session macam ni. So if you, if you switch on your camera, you could even screen capture your face beside Prof Adipa's face as an idol. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Teh Chui Jun. Good morning, Prof. May I ask if there's any advice for student leaders now and also for future aspiring academician? Thank you. Okay, uh, Teh, well, I think um, uh, really to, to summarize uh, what I said earlier, it is about developing a focus and a passion. Um, you know, academia is is tough, uh, a, a tough world. And if you are only doing things for the sake of doing things, then uh, I think it's very difficult to excel. Choose your area of focus, have that niche area and um, work on it with passion. Um, I think without that passion, it's, it's very difficult because you know, uh, because failure is is inevitable. Uh, it is a question of whether it's small or large. Um, so uh, that that would be my number one um, advice: uh, have a passion, pick pick your area of focus, uh, something that you love uh, to do, and then it's teamwork and collaboration. I think this is something that we all can do better um, and unfortunately and I, I hope not but um, you know having these KPIs can make us more um, selfish can make us more uh, retreat into our inner self as we work towards getting that that paper which is very counterproductive um, so we, we really have to be quite careful and quite balanced in how we do this um, uh, you know, look around us, uh, those people who succeed are not people who walk alone. If you want to go far, you walk together. If you want to yeah. walk fast, you walk alone. But if you want to walk far and far and fast, you have to work together. Correct. <laughs> to do both. Yeah. Um, Dr. Adelina, would you like to switch on your camera and microphone and ask uh, Prof Adiba? Adina, you're more than welcome to ask your question. Any 
and uh, the incoming one is from Dr. Amira. Can Prof share your daily or weekly schedule? <laughs> you don't mind addressing that. I think Adelina said uh, before that, Adelina asked, how do I deal with subordinates who are demotivated and affected by changes imposed by the higher ups? Mm. I'm going to answer this in a very silly way and uh, uh, <laughs> I no longer have to deal with it because I'm not the dean anymore. <laughs> no, only joking. <laughs> only joking. Um, it, it's, it's an important question uh, and, and like I said before, uh, you know, it, it does involve, um, you know, speaking to to those. Hello, you're about to go to school. Is your school well ventilated? <laughs> I'm obsessed by ventilation, as I said. Um, so, yeah, uh, how do I deal with you? It's it's about um, it's 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 about seeing the you know the a, a common purpose. Um, and sitting down with them and uh, finding ways to uh, work around it, I suppose. Yeah. Not easy, not easy. That, that's a question um, from the Excel file. Where do we start? Sorry, I got distracted from my younger daughter going yeah. to school. How do we start? Where do we start? Oh, of oh. money. Yeah. Um, it's not in the chat section. Um, it's from Kita, Kitara. Mm -hmm. Okay. How uh, do we start what in terms of? Uh, okay, let me read the whole one. I would like to make an impact towards my community. As a woman myself, I would like to know where to start. How do I make my way through and would like to gain some inspiration? Uh, inspiration from you, of course, but I guess the question is where do I say it? Is there any problem, uh, any platforms for like-minded women? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think again, um, it, it's finding, it's doing something that you love, that you believe in, um, and reaching out to people who are like-minded and, and building up from there. I think there's there's no other way uh, to that. Yeah. So we start individually from our inner self. Correct. We build. We we don't or we can't wait for the community to be ready no, before we no, go. No, definitely not. You have to reach out, but be, be be clear about, you know, what you want to do and, and what areas you want to focus in. And it goes back again to believing in it and uh, having a passion for it. Tak boleh buat-buat punya because it's, uh, it's a lifelong thing, kan? Yeah. That's where the grit comes in, the commitment comes in and Ch yeah. whatever challenge that may come your way you you will find a way around it to get that happen yeah um so amira uh, is, wants to know wants me to share my daily or weekly schedule are you ready for this <laughs> <laughs> okay so i wake up usually about 6 30 in the morning for subo and all that and as i say um i i have this workout um maybe four or five times a week and then I go to work you know um, and have a full day there how do I manage, manage my time in between so you know um, again uh, uh, it's about prioritizing uh, I'll have you all know that my day kind of ends about 11 because um, you know, when I come back, have dinner, um, uh, uh, then I um, usually, usually at least two or three nights a week, I will have overseas calls um, because of the International Aid Society, is the Secretariat's in Geneva. Um, and we have at least two conferences, two large conferences that we run each year. Um, and prepare for the next one. For instance, uh, I will chair the, the July conference. This is supposed to be our baby conference, and that's, you know, if, if we were able to have it in Berlin, like we we're planning to, that would usually attract about 8,000 people. So now it's going virtual. So currently the the planning, uh, not more than the planning, it's uh, all of that is underway, um, you know, so that, requires almost weekly 
conference calls with my co-chair, uh, Professor Hendrik Sendrik in Berlin, the IAS Secretariat in Geneva, um, and the Scientific Committee. Um, so that that's that. And then on top of that, the other IAS programs and all of that. So two to three, sometimes even four calls just for IAS each week. Um, and I'm also now on the Lancet Commission. Uh, I'm, I'm co-chairing the Lancet Commission for Health and Human Rights uh, with my very good friend and colleague Chris Byra from Hopkins University. So that also requires uh, weekly, almost weekly calls. Um, again, it's at night because this commission has about 21 commissioners from all over the world. And so, you know, to to align the time zones, uh, we usually have calls at about 10 o'clock at night. Um, and many, many other things. Uh, oh, and then of course my collaborators, uh, Rick Ortiz at Yale, we, ha we now have, I think, three or four grants, I've lost touch, um, and another grant on stigma. So that, that necessitates, um, if not weekly, uh, second weekly course. So I, I work at night a lot. Like I said, I'm very lucky. I don't have to do any, any cooking, any washing, and all of that. So I come home, I shower, I have dinner, I st go straight back to work. So it's, it's not possible to do all this and keep up uh, with all of this without having the love and passion for it. And secondly, of course, the, um, the you know, you can't underestimate the positive reinforcement from working with people at that level and, you know, getting that international exposure. I, I, I was joking with my colleagues at the IAS. I said I suddenly became a local celebrity because I interviewed Tony Fauci. You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, very proud of that. So, so all that positive reinforcement that then you know makes motivates me to to keep doing things at this high level um, again. And then of course the. Um, the the little wins locally. You know whether it's in drug policy reform. Or, or whatever, um, you know, when you see, you, when you start seeing results from what you do, then it makes it all worthwhile. So I go to bed at about 11 or so. So I work around the clock. The other day, I can't remember who interviewed me, I think it was for MMA interview, said, oh my God, Prof Adiba, all you seem to do is work. And I said, <laughs> true uh i can't remember what was it i mean i try i haven't watched the the latest uh installation of uh, the crown on netflix you know people talk about the net netflix uh, seasons but i've not watched tv I, i've sort of gone off uh watching tv ever since uh, the boys I've, ever since i had the boys i just can't sit there and watch tv even if i watch i have to have the laptop with me i just can't <laughs> like set it down. When I go to movies, I fall asleep. Um, so the boys uh, and my husband joke that I'm like the, the movie barometer. If I stay awake after the credits, the opening credits come up, then it's going to be a good movie. You know, um, when I go to the movies, I bring airline socks and, and pashmina and all ready to sleep. <laughs> So, so it's uh, yeah. So the movies are uh, a barometer for me, for for my children of how good it is if mum stays awake uh, throughout the whole movie. Aww. So how do I find time to write, read, and think? Um, yeah, it's about prioritizing, and uh, yeah, that's that's the only way. Mm -hmm. And you know, when when it comes to the crunch. Um, especially for these high-level um, papers like this Lancet Commission and Lancet Series and all that, because, you know, usually takes so many, many rewrites. Often, you know, we're up till four or five in the morning, literally chatting with people in the U.S., whoever your co-authors are, to rewrite, um, because, you know, time is of the essence. So, like I said, you, you've got to enjoy doing it uh, to kind of be happy to wake up at two in the morning to write papers or whatever or stay up till four or five in the morning but I think a lot of you do that as well so yeah I guess it's the 
phase of our life will determine whether we are able or unable to do that. You know, before maybe for me, before I had my uh, first daughter, I was able to do that. And you know, after a while, before between my second and third daughter, which is quite a gap, I could do that. And now that my son is just 10 months, 11 months old, I couldn't do that. You know, I guess it's a phase of life that um, yeah. don't be jealous of anyone's advantage or disadvantage. You, you, you'll find your way and your own um, tune to it. And yeah. yeah. Um, Prof. Camilla is here. Would you like to turn the camera, Prof. Camilla? She just made a comment. Don't you all wonder if you are really talking to Prof. Adiba right now? I have a feeling she's a clone. I'm working from home, Prof. Camilla. <laughs> I'm I will be going in a bit later. So, yeah, I've decided to take charge of my own life and I work from home when I can. <laughs> Hello. It's, it's for that mental. There you go, Prof. Camilla. <laughs> Report me if you like. <laughs> Excuse me. We don't have to get defensive here. I wasn't checking up on you or anything like that. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Prof. Camila. Yeah, I, I, I know you have the studio lights at home, so all set up. So yeah. it's perfectly done at home. Yeah. yeah. I can go and, and steal something from the fridge. <laughs> no, I, I was just saying, you know, you're such a superwoman. Everybody wants to know how you do it. And, no, you know, really, you are probably, we're not really talking to you right now. We're probably talking to some <laughs> robot and you are actually physically somewhere else. You know, so. uh, mm -hmm. I'm a robot. I've signed in with, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's well, a, that's a I'm, off. I'm off now, so okay. I just wanted, I just wanted, keep your camera on. To you want to have a, 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 a photo with everyone on? Oh, Dr. Noran, uh, can we please have a picture together? Maybe this is the right, the good time for us to switch on all our cameras. Yeah. But I just want to say one thing to yes, Dr. Azra yes. crying is not a female thing, so it's not, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't encourage the. Okay. the yeah, the that's, that's the thing to <laughs> It's not a sign of weakness. I hope. Definitely not. Definitely not. Let's all switch on our cameras. Um, I hope we can fit everyone in. Microsoft Teams has a limit of fifty, and <laughs> we're slightly a little bit more than fifty. Okay. Let's try. Uh, Linda, are you getting ready for the screen capture? Let me just try yes, to I'm getting ready. <coughs> okay, let's wipe our tears. If it's still there. <laughs> yeah. All right, if All right. everyone could smile. One, two, three. Okay. okay. Yeah, let me take one more. Okay, more coming. I, I can see more coming. Baru nak, you know, betul-betulkan tudung. Up <laughs> sikit, touch up. Okay. On, uh, any more coming? Uh, Dr. Amiruddin. Ah, there you are. Okay, thank you. I think you're the outlier here. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Encik, Encik Nizam is here too. Thank I you for supporting the international Support her, support her. Yes, that, that's... Okay, ready everyone? Yes. All right. One, two, three, smile. All right, I got it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you, Prof Adiba. Thank you. See you soon, Prof Camila. Prof yes. Adiba, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank yes, you so much. Lunch. I think this is a, the, the, the just nice time to end our session. It's, uh, we've been, um, online for almost two hours now it didn't feel like two hours at all um perhaps a few summary points that i could just refresh our minds um of the two hours most important is to believe in science and build your credibility then your voice will be heard and it's about making impact choose your battle or you know pick your battle Choose your niche area and work on it with passion. I think that's that's the key message that Prof. Adiba keeps. Um, 
you know, repeating herself, passion, 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 do things for the right reason. And we also talk about teamwork and collaboration. We talk about um, having vision, about uh, collegiality, the importance of collegiality, um, how to manage resistance, manage resources, uh, the prioritizing the decisions that we want to make, um, grit in whatever um, challenges that comes our way, um, financial constraints, um, you know, people's opinion. So we did talk about a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'm really honored myself to be moderating this session and having all of you with us right now. Thank you so, so much again, Prof Adiba. We will uh, keep hearing from you. We know, we, <laughs> we are very sure that we'll keep hearing from you, but it's, it's really an honor to have you during our International Women's Day special organized by ADEC. Thank you Thank so you. much, everybody. We will end the session now. Thank you so much, Prof Adiba. Any last words, Prof Adiba? No, keep doing all the things that you all do and, uh, you know, uh, we're all in this together. Yeah. Thank you so much. With that, I end the session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat petang. Have a good lunch, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Adiva. Thank you, Dr. Thank Azza. You. Quick reminder Thank to everyone so to fill up the Thank feedback you. form. Oh, yes, yes. We have a feedback form. We always forget yes. the photo session, but <laughs> we don't forget the feedback form. Now we forget the feedback form but we did the photo session. The feedback form is on uh, the chat section. Um, we really need that um, uh, for our, our record. I'm sure it'll be all, all five stars, but yeah, we, we just want to keep record of it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Azza, for having me. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks Azza. Thank you. Bye.